Well, hi, everybody. I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to Get Real with Rick Dancer. Great to have you here. We have a great show for you tonight. Um, you know, I don't know what you're going to learn tonight, but I think you're going to learn a bunch. Um, I was recently at my gym uh, taking a high intensity training class, looked over and there's a stranger near me. <laughs> well, he's no stranger than me, but he's a stranger. And uh, we start talking and he's the author of a book called The People's Justice About Justice um, Clarence Thomas. And I was like, what the heck are you doing in Helena, Montana? So he started talking to me and I said, man, I got to have you on a podcast. So he's going to be our guest tonight. We're going to talk about the book, talk about his thoughts. And uh, it, it should be really fun. We can't do this show without our sponsors. Family Dentistry. Uh, I love this topic because he's a big guy on freedom of speech and people having the right to use their voice. While he takes care of your teeth and your mouth, he allows you to take care and use your voice. Our other sponsor tonight, Albert Taylor, Endless Possibilities. They work with folks in our community who are, I used to be referred to as people with disabilities, but we understand that's not true. They're just people with different abilities. If you're looking for a career move or something that'll make you feel like you're doing something great every day, give them a call. I'm going to give them two shots. Also, Montana Oral Surgeons and Dental Implant Center here in Helena, Montana. Uh, wonderful people also support very much what we do. And Greg Hinkle, now with New America Funding, another freedom lover and a guy who really wants to get your business. Rains, heating, and air conditioning out of Crestwell, Oregon. Now is the time, especially I hear some parts of the country, especially where Amul, our guest, is living. If you haven't had your air conditioning serviced, <laughs> you're in deep doo-doo. <laughs> it's too late for you. And if you want your body dealt with, New Leaf Hyperbarics and Wellness Center in Eugene, Oregon, Matt McCarl. They also do uh, red light therapy. They also do saunas. They do massage. Uh, give them a call. If you tell them you saw it here, they'll give you a deal on your first time. All right, let's get right to our topic. Amul Thepar, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks, Rick, for having me. It's funny you put up the heating and AC ad. I mean, as I told you, our AC is out and it's about 100 degrees here. So I and wish I was in Montana with you enjoying the snow. <laughs> so tell people where you are. I am right outside Cincinnati, Ohio, in the great Commonwealth of Kentucky, where we have the best brown liquid in the world known as bourbon. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> you actually do. So, um, you know, I like this guy because I trust him because he works out the same way I do hard. And I mean, we took this class and it's high intensity and interval training. And you kept right up with everybody else. And I was going, who, who is this guy? Because not many people come in, especially of the male gender um, and uh, do very well in that class. Yeah, I think it's good for us. I hope your listeners uh, will do some of that. I think it's good for the heart. And it really, it, it's a humbling experience when you see these, most people who are older than you just best you in every which way. It keeps you motivated to show you, you can always get better. We have a woman in there. I think you were standing next to her. Her name's Kathy and she's 79 years old. And it's just, you know, he embarrassed as, me, Rick. Just, I know if it's, it was videoed like this, people would be like, oh, my God. Well, if every time a new guy comes in the class, I go, don't feel too shamed by her. Yeah. <laughs> but it so, also motivates you because it lets you know you can get to 79 or 80 or 85 and still be doing it. Right. Exactly. So, um, Amul, who, who are you? I know you're an author of this book. Um, but kind of give people a little of your background and history and me too. I want to know as well. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a child of immigrants, very proud immigrants. I, I like to tell a little bit about my dad because he had a much more difficult life than me. Um, he grew up in a family of five raised by a single mother in India. Um, really a remarkable story. They were dirt poor, as you can imagine, nothing like what Americans perceive as poor. I mean, this was a different kind of poor, no running water, no bathroom, things like that. And um, sadly, his dad passed away when he was two. So uh, a, a single mother in India at a time when discrimination was a thing, or like it still is, obviously, but it was 
really bad against women then. And I think it, it, I, I don't want to comment on India politics. It may or may not it, it exist to the same levels. I think I hope it exists less um, in India. But nonetheless, my mom uh, or my grandmother saved up and put him on an airplane, got a one way ticket, gave him five bucks and said, good luck go to America. This was back in the 50s. And my dad worked three jobs, eventually went through college and, you know, gave us a much better life than he had. So as a child of immigrants, that's the way I was raised. I always appreciated the greatness of this country because of the opportunities it has given my family. And anyone that knows Indians knows the crown jewels of families in the Indian culture are doctors and engineers. I'm neither. My sister is the doctor. She remains the crown jewel of the family. But I ended up going to law school. When I called my dad and told him I was going to law school, he asked me why I would go to graduate school to work an hourly job. Um, (laughs) Because I can charge a lot an hour, Dad. (laughs) That's right. That's right. And eventually I was blessed enough to be put on the federal bench to cut a long story short. We could spend the whole time on my biography. My wife always jokes that, you know, I could, no matter what I do, good things keep happening to me. And that's kind of how I got here. A lot of luck. And I'm on the federal bench in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the U.S. Court of Appeals in the Sixth Circuit. So the book about Clarence Thomas, Justice Thomas, um, how did this come about? You obviously sat down. Did you sit down with him? I mean, kind of tell us the story. I did not. So I did not talk to him. And really, he's uh, what I wanted to do is I'm an originalist like him, like Justice Scalia. Um, Justice Scalia was the first, you know, kind of not the first one. Obviously, Brutus talked about originalism. Brutus, the famous anti-federalist that was challenging the Federalists when he and Hamilton went back and forth. And Justice Scalia made originalism come back into kind of the current legal thinking. And lawyers really subscribed to it. And I wanted to take originalism to lay people. And I actually drafted a few chapters of a book that was just called Originalism for Lay People. And I, you know, my wife made me write the book in the basement. It's the only space she gave me in the house where I can have an office. It's not really an office. If people saw it, they would laugh at it, but it is an office. And it's one I actually love now down in, it kind of in a hole, but in an area in the basement that's private. And I brought up the first few chapters of Originalism for Lay People. I was so proud of this book, Rick. I thought it was fascinating and interesting. I talked about Hamilton who, of course, is now famous through the musical, should be famous. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I talked about Madison and Brutus, as I just mentioned. And I give the transcript to my wife, the person I love the most in the world. And (laughs) she's got her, you know, she's got her cup of coffee and she reads the first few pages and she looks up at me and says, says, who's going to read this S-H blank blank? Wow. (laughs) And you thought the critics were bad. Yeah. And so I was back to the drawing board, but what I I then gave up for a few months. But when I started back, I thought about the stories of, you know, every case or controversy that we deal with is in many ways a human drama. And I think I'm not criticizing the media here. I don't want it to be taken that way. But when they report, they just report on a snippet and not the entire story, not what's really going on. And I thought originalism had gotten a bad rap. They had often said that originalism favors the rich over uh, the poor, the strong over the weak, the corporation over the consumer, the government over the individual. When if you think about the original document, in fact, the opposite is true in many ways. And what I wanted to show is some famous cases and some non-famous cases that people wouldn't know about where the facts tell a different story than what the public knows and shows Justice Thomas's rulings in a different light. And the interesting thing is, I think it's caused people not only to read the book because it's written, and I think people like the writing because it's in novel style, The People's Justice, but it's also um, tells the stories of the cases, which I think really helps people understand the cases in a much better way. And I can tell you one of them. I can give a sneak peek. I think it'll help the reader understand, but the, or your listeners understand, but that's up to you. No, I would love that. But first, tell people what originalism is so that to everybody, because obviously you wrote a book about it because you knew most people don't know when you're sitting on the federal bench, you probably realize most people don't know what this is. 
and then we'll go into the, the story. And then I also want to know why Clarence Thomas. But let's let's start with the what is originalism. So originalism is interpreting the Constitution consistent, or if you're, it's also known as textualism when you're inter- interpreting a statute consistent with the words and meaning at the time it was ratified. Okay. So the easiest way to explain it is the example, when I was appointed to the Sixth Circuit, my neighbor, one of my best friends came down and he said, oh my God, Amul, I read in the paper, you're one of those. (laughs) And I said, one of what? And he said, you're an originalist. Like I was diseased, right? Like that's a bad thing. Yeah. And I said to him, I said, hey, Mike, you're a businessman, right? Yes. And he said, yes. And I said, you often sign contracts, correct? When I interpret that contract, if you get in a dispute with the person you signed a contract with, should I interpret the words and meaning of the terms as you and the person you signed them with understood it? Or should I tell you what I think's best and what's best for you? And he said, of course, you should interpret it consistent with what we meant. And so what I said to him is, Mike, you're an originalist too now. And he ran back up to his house like I had just told him something he never wanted to hear. And so so have we we lost that in the court system today? No, I think it's more prominent than ever, thanks to, like I said, Justice Scalia, Robert Bork, Ed Meese, bringing it back, and then Justice Thomas and others kind of pushing it forward. I think Justice Thomas is thought of in many ways as the ultimate originalist today. And so what I really wanted to do with the book is show the American people what an originalist America would look like if judges interpreted the Constitution consistent with the terms. And I think people will be surprised when they read the book. In fact, my best friend from high school thinks much differently than me. He was shocked when he read the book. So tell me the story. About- okay. So, so do you want me to get, I'll give you the first chapter. I'm just going to tell your readers. So um, Suzette Kilo was this, is this remarkable woman. And one of the privileges of the book is getting to interview some of the plaintiffs and that they're the real heroes of the book. And Suzette was down on her luck. Her and her husband had just had a falling out and she was looking for a house and she was a paramedic. So she didn't have a lot of money and she found what she thought was the perfect house. It was a rundown house, but she really wanted a view of the water. That was a dream her whole life. And so in New London, Connecticut, in the Fort Trumbull neighborhood, a beautiful blue collar neighborhood, she found a house that's really rundown. So rundown that the real estate agent asked her if she was sure like four times before she accepted her offer. Um, But she ultimately did accept her offer. And Suzette didn't have a lot of money as a paramedic who had just gotten separated from her husband after she successfully raised five boys. And so Suzette rolled up her sleeves and through blood, sweat and tears, she invested her time, effort and money into the house. Not only that, she's such a remarkable woman that at night she took correspondence courses to become a nurse and ultimately became a nurse. And her house, she turned the house into this beautiful um house with siding, you know, with a view of the river. And she painted it her favorite color, Odessa pink. Now, a lot of people laugh when I say that when you saw her house and there's pictures in the book of her house, it really was beautiful. And Suzette would get home from work, a hard day of work as a nurse where you're on your feet all day. She'd grab a bottle of wine, go out on her back porch, looking out over the Thames River and crack open that wine and just enjoy a glass of wine. I wish it would have been a glass of bourbon, but she chose wine. So, (laughs) Well, you're from Kentucky, so there you go. (laughs) Yeah, probably Oregon wine or something good, like Willamette Valley. But in any event, um, while all this was going on, trouble was brewing in New London. Down the road from Suzette was an old mill site. And the city, understandably, and state, wanted... to bring in a company, but not just any company. They wanted a Pfizer or a a top Fortune 100 company. And they found the perfect partner in the Pfizer Corporation. The Pfizer Corporation had just come up with their wonder drug that they thought was going to save the world. No, it wasn't the vaccine. It was Viagra. (laughs) They uplifted the world. That's right. This is their plan. 
And so they wanted to build labs. But in order for Pfizer to come in, they told the city and state that they'd only come in if they made a deal. They had to give them high rise condos with views of the water. They had to build high rise condos so their executives could live there. They had to build an outdoor shopping mall with things like Lululemon or whatever uh, executives go to. Um, and they had to put health clubs and fitness clubs and other things there. And they wanted a park. And in order to do this, they wanted to su take Suzette's blue collar neighborhood. Wow. Now, there's a concept that your listeners may have heard of known as eminent domain. And yes, it's in the Constitution. And in the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, it says the government may take your property. Now, I want to remind you, the government may take your property for public use with just compensation. I want you to listen to those words, public use with just compensation. Well, um, I, I'm going to cut the long story short. They can read all the details in the chapter. But uh, what ultimately happens is the city of New London sends real estate agents to Suzette and her neighbors and tries to get them to sell. But they don't want to sell because one of Suzette's neighbors, for example, is the Dairy family. And the Dairy family is this amazing family that's been in the neighborhood for over 100 years. They loved the neighborhood so much, they came up with this brilliant idea that when their kids got married, as a wedding present, they'd put a down payment on a house in the neighborhood. Oh, wow. Now, Rick, that's brilliant, right? You get your kids to live by you. Right, right. Yes, yeah, it's, it's blackmail. <laughs> but, it, it, but it shows how much they love the neighborhood. And so these people were not selling. This, uh, this was a 100-year-old neighborhood. And so they started looking for a lawyer because the city warned them that if they didn't sell, they were going to take their property through eminent domain. And they found a perfect lawyer in the name of Scott Bullock. Now, Scott had just made a name for himself taking on a casino mogul in New Jersey. And this casino mogul wanted to take a, a parking lot by eminent domain or take a couple of houses by eminent domain and turn it into a limousine turnaround. And he had, Scott had won that case in state court. And so they recruited Scott um, to be their lawyer. And Scott worked for a company called, or a law firm called the Institute for Justice. And he, he wasn't sure because he got thousands of letters. So he went up and visited them and he couldn't believe their neighborhood. Their neighborhood was beautiful. Yeah. It, was, it was this beautiful neighborhood. He couldn't believe anyone would want to take it. So Scott took on the case. I'm going to cut. It. They go through all the courts. The drama in the courts is amazing. There's a time where they're sleeping in a house that someone's rehabbing because they don't want it knocked down um, while the proceedings are going on and because he thought it would kill the morale of his plaintiffs who were Suzette Kilo, the Dairies and others. But the case gets to the Supreme Court. And Scott knew at the Supreme Court he was going to have an issue. And his issue was a case out of, from the 1950s called Berman. Berman's a case out of the District of Columbia, where the District of Columbia decided that they wanted to take an area, in fact, ironically, the most interracial area in D.C., and take it away from people, call it blighted. Some parts of it were blighted, but some had beautiful shops and other things, and take it and turn it over to a private developer. And in the 50s, the Supreme Court decided that the city could do that over the objection of the residents. And the reason they said they could do it is because it was for a pub. They weren't using it for a government use. Remember, as Justice Thomas would ultimately explain, a public use historically, as it was originally intended, meant taking your property for a sidewalk that the public could use or taking a sliver of your land to widen a road that the public could use, or maybe developing a, taking your entire property in the most extreme circumstance for railroads that the public would use. The, the thing here is in the 50s, the city, D.C. admitted they weren't taking it for public use. They said, no, we're taking it for private use, right? We're turning it over to a developer. And because we'll get higher tax income and we'll get rid of the blighted areas, and the Supreme Court said, well, if it's for a public purpose, that's good enough. Notice how they've changed the words of the Constitution. Right. So Scott's argument at the Supreme Court was Pfizer's purpose is not a public purpose. No. 
And so he didn't even ask the Supreme Court to go back to the original meaning. So they get to argument. And Justice Scalia asked this question, which I think your listeners will appreciate. Justice Scalia asked, so does that mean if the government takes it from A and gives it to B because B pays higher taxes, yeah. that would qualify? And the city's lawyer says yes. And Scalia sh- can't believe it. And he doubles down. And Scalia says, so what you're telling me is you can take from the poor and give to the rich because the rich pay more taxes. The answer was yes. The city's lawyer said yes. The case gets decided. And the case gets decided 5-4 and Suzette loses. In dissent, Justice O'Connor writes the principal dissent buying Scott's argument saying that um, her Rehnquist, Scalia, and Thomas are in dissent. And she says that Pfizer's purpose is not what the is not the public purpose and so it doesn't satisfy Berman and so Suzette should have won. Justice Thomas is the only one that goes it advocates going back to the original meaning. Now there's a ton of amicus briefs in this case. What amicus briefs means is parties of interest, people that aren't the parties but people interested. And one group advocated going back to the original meaning. Do you know who that was? Who? The NAACP. Really? And the reason they did is, as they point out in their brilliant brief, is that um, eminent domain is often used to prey on foreign minorities. In Justice Thomas's dissent, he says things that are, and it's worth your, after they read the chapter, they should go pull his dissent and read his dissent because it's a masterpiece. And it talks about how It's amazing that under our Constitution, as the Supreme Court now understands it, the public is safe in their house, meaning you're protected from searches without probable cause. But their houses themselves are not safe. (laughs) And and then and he goes through and goes through the history and the original meaning and what public use meant and how the courts shouldn't change the words of the Constitution, because that's not what the American people agreed to. And then he points to all the statistics showing that in the D.C. case, 97 percent of the people that were displaced were black. He points to the awful quotes that some of our politicians have used to talk about eminent domain. He points to all these things. You want to know the kicker? I'm going to give away the kicker to the chapter. What? What? Not only does Suzette Kilo lose, I went and visited her neighborhood. This case was back in 2004, 2005, 2007. I went and visited her neighborhood right before I published the book and I put a picture in it and they wiped out her entire neighborhood. But seven years after Pfizer showed up, they discovered Viagra wasn't the drug they thought it was and they left. And so today, Suzette's beautiful neighborhood, of which I include pictures in the book, is a, a field with long weeds, feral cats and rubble. That's all it is today, and a beautiful view of the water. So what? why now this book? Why do you think this book is so important for people to read now? It was looking at the politics, what's going on in our world, what's going on in our country. I think, sadly, our country has, in many ways, it's, it's you know, as I said, it's the greatest country in the world, and I want it to be, sorry about that, no. I want I want people to appreciate what's going on in the courts and understand that originalism really does is different than people understand it, than it's portrayed. And I think the best way to do it is include what the cases are about, but write them in a way, write the stories in a way that anyone would enjoy and understand it. Some people have said it's great beach reading, you know, that they took the people's justice to the beach and <clears throat> it's 12 in essence, short stories that'll show you what originalism's all about. And why Justice Thomas? Because he's the, um, I think most people perceive him as the ultimate originalist. I also think he's one of the most misunderstood figures in history. Uh, You know, his two idols, uh, people he just really looked up to in his life are his grandfather who raised him. And, um, Frederick Douglass 
And I think you see that you'll see it throughout the book and you'll see it throughout his opinions. Well, don't, and I mean, to stretch this topic just a little bit too, it's, it's like with the, with the statues and the expectations of people, um, you know, we all know slavery was bad, um, but we judge by based on what, what we see today and what we know versus what, what happened 150 years ago or 200 years ago. And if, you know, because if you really go back and I'm not asking you to comment on this, but you go back and Indians had other Indians as slave, not, I don't mean, in, well, probably in India as well, but slavery was a part of things we've learned and grown, but people are still judging by, by today's standard rather than going back. What was said when it was meant? What, who were they when they, when this all came about? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think um, everyone agrees. I mean, slavery was abhorrent and it's easy for us to see it. And but the one thing I would say is our founders, they were imperfect, right, in many right. ways. But the document they put together has withstood the test of time. And it has made this country the greatest country in the world, in addition to its people and the generous nature of its people. But I would really encourage people when they read the people's justice to, to, if they, you know, they'll read it. I, I promise they'll enjoy it. Um, they may disagree. I mean, there may be chapters they disagree with. That's the whole point, but we can do so. And I think I'd love, I think the courts, I hate to go off on a tangent here, but no, I, think, I think the courts and people should be the, the federal courts. I sit on the U S court of appeals. I have the best colleagues in the world. We disagree without being disagreeable. We are like brothers and sisters, right? We may disagree about things, but at the end of the day, we really genuinely like each other. I love my colleagues. Um, and I wish there was more of that in society. In other words, where we understood that we can disagree with others without being disagreeable and have those respectful conversations. And I just find uh, the courts, I've loved being a part of the courts and I want people to understand what we do. And this book is really an attempt at that. Do you worry about what's going on right now in, in the news and the news cycles um, with the court system that people are going to lose trust in the court system? That's my biggest worry. And that's why I think the book kind of, again, rather than reading the hyperbole, for me, there's, I'm not saying any side's perfect. Right. I want people to read the facts. And the thing about the book that you'll see is it's got an, a an incredible amount of end notes. You want to go check any fact, anything. You can go read the source materials. I mean, I actually went and read the cases, read the records, talked to the people involved. And I think what you'll find is it's much different than the snippets you can get in the media. And everything, when put in context, has a different color. Yeah. Do you find that when you were doing this research that you look at things and you go, because when you were saying it earlier, when you, you kind of, you kind of cued me in that, you know, it's like a good, like a good teacher, um, the people's what's good for the people that was good for Pfizer, what they did. And right. yes, you could stretch that, which we do today and say, okay, but then this community will benefit because we'll have more money and more tax dollars. And so people will benefit from this, but that no, go back to the meaning, the original meaning of what was going on here. And then you take it down to a sidewalk, a street. This isn't taking out a whole entire culture neighbor, you know, cause a neighborhood is a culture to me. So taking right. a culture and going, you don't have as much value as, uh, an, uh, as Viagra pill. You right. know? It's only, and I, I understand the argument, but I, the one thing I would say is just remember, these are people's neighborhoods. And so these are people's homes. And when you go through the book, I mean, the second chapter is about our public schools. The third, <clears throat> you know, there's a chapter about medical marijuana that'll surprise people. Um, there will make people understand like because because I think like you said we get so many headlines and you think you got to dig a little deeper than that to find out what that original meaning was what does that mean to this case we can't just go well hey yeah well they should have done this well no there's there's the constitution was decided or, or put together to protect it was about we the people right to protect us not the government <laughs> it was to protect us from the government <laughs> right Rick, hence the name, the people's justice. I mean, he is, and when you read it, you'll see why he's called, I coined it the people's justice, but I think you'll see that we, the people, the document itself, the document was in essence, I don't want to call it a contract, although I have several times, but it was 
the government, the, we created a government and we gave them limited powers in exchange for retaining our rights. And that's, right. that's really what the book's about. It's about what originalism's about. And you really get a flavor for it. Look, it's, it's not every case, right? I picked 12 and it's 12 short stories and I could have written a hundred of them, but I wanted to keep the book readable. And I, I think with 12, I think you get a flavor. Is there, is this also a way to maybe show people that everything you think may not be exactly as it is because you have to go back to the original document? Cause it's so easy to water down the con. Everybody has their, you know, it's, it's kind of like my truth, you know, there is truth. Yeah. And then there's this new thing called my truth. And I think we have a constitution and then we have this thing called the constitution for me or what it should be. Cause I want it to be that way. Um, that it really is out to protect people and through your stories in this book and Justice Thomas, you're showing um, that there is a there is a there is a standard and there's yeah. a you know, there's a there's a rod there. There's a foundation we can hold on to. Um, and right now it's it feels like there's not. But there really is if we go back to the original words. Yeah, I think that's right. And the people often say, well, that was 200 years ago or 200 plus years ago. How do we adapt for the times. And the answer is pretty simple, which is people say, what about our rights? What about this, that, and the other? We want new rights. Well, that's why you pass legislation. That's why you work with your neighbor and get legislation passed. Title VII, one of the great you know, rights protecting thing in modern society, protects people from discrimination and employment. That That is not part of the constitution. It is something that was passed by the legislature and signed into law. And so I think it's important that people work together to update our laws rather than fighting lawsuits to have courts do it. Thank you, Amul. That is, um, I can't wait. I saw it on Amazon. It's not super expensive and people can pick it up um, at any bookstore. Also, like I said, I found it on Amazon, The People's Justice. Um, thank you for coming to my class and introducing yourself. That's uh that's how this all started. And it's been really nice. I, I'm going to go read it now because I, I like the way you do that is tell it through stories of other people. And what do you think Clarence Thomas would say when if he read it? Uh, he doesn't like reading things about himself. So I don't know if he's read it, but I think he would enjoy it. I think he'd even learn a lot of this about the facts. I mean, he knows them all from the when he had the cases. But I think I did, you know, I dove into the trial record and did stuff about the trial and stuff. When well, you so, went and interviewed people too. Right. Yeah. It, so it you see the after effect of what your decision did and good, bad and ugly. Yeah. And, and people, you know, there's a lot of remarkable people I interviewed. Ironically, a lot of remarkable women like Kathy McKee will surprise people to find that one of the chapters is about the victims of Bill Cosby. And who stood up for the victims and then one and I'll, I'll leave that cliffhanger and other ones about Angel Raich and her quest to use medical marijuana. And Angel's this remarkable woman that kind of opened my eyes in a lot of ways. I learned a lot from Angel. And so it was a real treat. to, And they really are. They're the heroes of the book. They're the ones who brought the lawsuit and lived through all this. You know, judges and justices were here to enforce the laws it was written, hopefully. Um, but really, the heroes are the people fighting for their livelihood or fighting for their homes or fighting for their education, the parents fighting for their education, the education of their kids. So last thing I'll ask you. So sometimes as a federal judge, do you sit and look at people in your courtroom and think, man, there are some really brave, strong, amazing people out there in the United States of America? I mean, because you know what I mean? almost every day. It's remarkable. I mean, I see, and I was a trial judge for 10 years, and you see that firsthand in a way that at the Court of Appeals, you know about it, but you don't see it in the same way. And I think that's one of the things that struck me the most about Justice Thomas's jurisprudence. And I'll leave your listeners with this. When you're in the trial court, you see people all the time. You see real people. You see the human drama of the cases. As the cases go up, they become less about the people and more about the legal concepts. And that's what we talk about in the paper and everything else. What Justice Thomas and his opinions reflect is he never forgets 
that there's real people involved. He always comments about the real people involved. He has something about them in his decisions. And I think that's really important and that's often lost in the court system. It reminded me to remember every day there are real people involved and what we're deciding is really important. No matter how minuscule the case may seem in the grand scheme of things, every case matters to to people, to real people who have real lives. And it's important, you know, we take every treat every case the same because of that. Okay, I know you have a meeting to get to and I can look up at your clock and I think we're just a teeny bit late. Uh, thank you so much for joining me um, and uh, coming on and talking to people. And again, the people's justice and I'll remind people in just a minute, okay? Thanks a well, lot. Well, thank you for having me. Have a great day. All right, see you later. So there again, uh, you can look on Amazon. I just I just Googled it and found it. It pops up and uh, ordered the book. And, you know, I'm going to get it because maybe it'll restore your faith in um, a system that seems kind of screwed up right now. And it's nice to talk to a federal appeals court judge and find out some other information. And uh, it might even help you understand a little bit better who Clarence Thomas actually is um, rather than what the media tells you. All right. I'm Rick Dancer. This is Get Real with Rick Dancer. Share this on your page so other people can see it and go out and buy the book and uh, I'll put it up again. Again, it's called The People's Justice. Have a good week.